May 10th. Thank God for the rain, which has helped wash away the garbage and the trash off the sidewalks. Someday a real rain will come and wash all the scum off the streets. Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore. A man who stood up against the scum, the cunts, the dogs, the filth, the shit. Here is someone who stood up. I'm standing here. You make the move. You make the move. I think you're a lonely person. I drive by this place a lot. I see you here. I see a lot of people around you. And I see all these phones and all this stuff on your desk. And it means nothing. And then when I came inside and I met you, I saw in your eyes and I saw the way you carried yourself that you're not a happy person. And I think you need something. And if you want to call it a friend, you can call it a friend. Here is. I don't like my real name. Oh, what's your real name? Iris. Well, what's wrong with that? That's a nice name. Why won't you talk to me? Why don't you answer my calls when I call? You think I don't know you're here? Let's not have any you think trouble. I don't know. It's pretty insane to think about the legacy of Martin Scorsese. Throughout this man's entire filmography, he has made at least one cinema-defining film per decade. His most popular are his gangster crime films, all of them having this distinct style. Martin Scorsese hails from New York, and that urban, loudmouth style of New York carries over into his films. Whether it's Goodfellas, Casino, The Irishman, or Wolf of Wall Street, all these films carry this distinct, loud, yet humanistic style. His most famous movies are abrasively witty, yet incredibly thought-provoking. That's not to imply that Scorsese isn't versatile, though. In fact, quite the opposite. Films like The Last Temptation of Christ and Hugo portray a large amount of atmosphere and heart, and are amazing underrated films in their own right. I mean this in the best way possible, it's a shock that Martin Scorsese isn't dead or retired, and that he's still in the industry to this day. I tend to view Martin Scorsese on the same level as Stanley Kubrick, Jean-Luc Godard, Akira Kurosawa, Andrei Tarkovsky, or Ingmar Bergman, all of whom are sadly long past away. But the fact that as of writing this video, Martin Scorsese is still alive and kicking, and still has the reputation he does is impressive. One film that absolutely put him on the map though is Taxi Driver. A film that is 46 years old and still relevant to this day. A film that has both influencees and imitators, and yet absolutely still stands on its own two feet nearly 50 years later. It is an absolute artistic masterpiece. And today, I, a brick Lego figure, I'm gonna talk about about it. The film stars Travis Bickle, played okay. by Robert De Niro, okay. a discharged Vietnam vet working as a taxi driver in New York. He's socially inept and incredibly lonely. This film is widely considered one of the first in the literally me genre, and part of that is because Travis Bickle is an identifiable character. A lot of people relate to him and resonate with him. He's lonely, oftentimes sad. The times he tries to relate with people, he's instantly shut down. My name is Travis. That's nice. Well, I can know what your name is. What's your name? Do you want me to call manager? Oh, you don't have to call the manager. I mean, I'm just asking. Troy! All right, okay. I'm just... In fact, Travis Bickle is so relatable, uh, even Kojima resonates with him. I, too, have struggled with feelings of loneliness since I was a child. The worst were during my adolescent years. And that was when I came across the movie Taxi Driver. Immediately, I thought, this is my movie. I wasn't a New York taxi driver, and I didn't pour brandy on my cereal. I didn't take my dates to a porno theater. I certainly never attempted to assassinate a presidential candidate, and yet I was Travis. After the movie was over, I bought the same military jacket as De Niro wore for his performance, put on leather boots, and went out into the city. To complete the imitation, I thrust my hands into my pockets and walked with a slouch. Hold on, wait a minute. He does what to his cereal? Yeah, another thing. Travis Bickle is the quintessential anti-hero. And with that comes a lot of, uh, problems. Why, yes, he does take a date to a porno theater. Why, yes, he does often stalk her. Why, yes, he does try and fight people for her favor in an office building, disrupting the peace. Why, yes, he does try and assassinate a political candidate. All these things he absolutely does try and do. However, because of this, there are some 
pretty bad misreadings of the movie. The big one being, you're not supposed to relate to Travis. However, time and time again with these character studies, I disagree completely with this kind of sentiment. Here's the thing, you are absolutely supposed to relate to Travis Bickle. This character represents the kind of loneliness we all feel, and therefore he is a representation of every single kind of loneliness. Social isolation, social anxiety, depression, sexual repression, political frustration. Travis Bickle is a combination of all of these ideas, and to some extent, he is kind of a positive one. He takes that negative energy and does things like work out and save a child prostitute. However, to another extent, he is absolutely also the negative one. Just a reminder, he saves Iris by brutally murdering people. Which, I mean, killing pedophiles is base, but I mean, it's also illegal. People go, well, he's not being a hypocrite, and that's the worst part. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we've already mentioned the porno theater, the stalking. All this, however, makes Travis Bickle the definition of morally gray. Travis Bickle serves as a warning. The warning of embracing too much loneliness. Part of the point of the film is that you are capable of the same crimes as Travis, which make his darker moments much more shocking. Not only are they from a character you resonate with, but you could also become these darker elements yourself. Equally important is the political context of Taxi Driver. Knowing the political context of America at the time is very important to understanding Taxi Driver. Or, if not, it makes it a hell of a lot more interesting to me. And that's some pretty valuable context. The movie came out in 1976, one year after the end of the Vietnam War. Vietnam and Nixon happened. The Watergate scandal happened. This caused both political distrust and an era of uncertainty for America. The sexual revolution happened. Nightclubs and discos became part of the mainstream. American nightlife became more openly promiscuous. And with it came a new level of griminess. The 1970s were a lingering age of uncertainty. It was right after the extremely devastating Vietnam War, but right before Reagan's patriotism. This kind of lingering uncertainty bleeds all throughout Taxi Driver, both in the main character and the universe he inhabits. Travis Bickle is a look into the mindset of an isolated man living in the 70s. He looks at everyone else as disgusting scum, and yet he himself is a contradiction. He'll complain about sex in the back of his cab, yet go to porno theaters. Each night when I return the cab to the garage, I have to clean the cum off the back seat. He shows both praise and distrust for politics, while also never fully understanding them. He is isolated from the dingy New York streets, and yet he is cut from those streets. The streets that we see so viscerally throughout the film. The rain, the lights, the fog, the dreamy colors. Visually alone, Taxi Driver's New York is not a friendly place. And yet, while it is so grimy, it's also beautiful. As if the city itself is a femme fatale. This beauty out of grime would go on to influence people like Wong Kar Wai and Ridley Scott. And of course, we further meet the city of New York as well. One of my favorite scenes of Taxi Driver has to be the infamous passage Scene. And no, it's not because Martin Scorsese in his director cameo says the n-word. Although it is incredibly based. But let's take a much deeper look. We meet our passenger. He instructs Travis to put down the meter. Already, he's incredibly on edge. Silently, the two of them wait for what feels like forever. The music grows more ominous. He instructs Travis to look at the window of one of the apartments, where the silhouette of a woman stands smoking, where he reveals that... I want you to see that woman, because that's my wife. Yep, his wife is cheating on him. And for a moment, we feel empathy. I'd feel the same way if my my wife was fucking some other guy. But then, uh... But you know who lives there? Huh? A lives there. And I'm, go I'm gonna kill her. <laughs> Listen. It's nothing else, I just, I'm gonna kill her. And as the conversation continues, the more disturbing its contents get. Did you ever see? Did you ever see what a 44 Magnum pistol would do to a woman's face? I mean, it would fucking destroy it. Just blow her right apart. Now, did you ever see what it could do to a woman's pussy? And that you should see. That you should see what a 44 Magnum is going to do a woman's pussy, you should see. It is a very disturbing conversation, and yet it tells us so much about the world of Taxi Driver. The wife and adulterer in question we never meet. However, obviously, cheating is bad. So we know the wife is unfaithful and not a great person. At least presumably. I know that's a very simple concept, but hear me out. However, once we learn about her husband, how he wishes to kill her, and the ways he wishes to do so, we understand that he might not be the best person either, exactly. Which begs questions like, what did he do to his wife that caused her to cheat on him. Maybe she had a damn good reason, judging he's a fucking wacko. There's something more interesting and important about this scene, though, in my opinion. This kind of duality of sin, how everyone in the situation fucked up in some way, creates the small little vacuum of sin that tells us so much about the world of New York. This wife we never meet, this man we only meet once, and Travis Bickle himself. All of them are cut from the exact same cloth. They're all part of the dingy New York underground. Nobody is free of sin. It's as if under the colors, the lights, the glamour, right? 
right under the beautiful surface is a disgusting underbelly of people that are just as horrible as they are nuanced. And Travis is a product of his environment. The loneliness, the politics, the sin, all of that gave birth to him. I feel like a Travis Spickle like character will always remain relevant throughout history. A character who is emotionally isolated or emotionally inept. An appeal to the kind of general vague idea of loneliness. It's a shared empathetic experience. Looking at a film like Ryan Gosling's Drive, it was really interesting seeing that movie gain popularity a year or two ago. On top of the, I'm really sorry, the Doomer meme. Similar to how Drive was popular during the Doomer era, during COVID-19 and social media disillusionment, and how a lot of lonely people happened to relate to it, while the film also provided a main character who was morally gray yet identifiable, and used that as a basis for both subversion and engagement. Taxi Driver was that during the Vietnam era, in a world of political disillusionment, not unlike the one we have now. The world of these characters, much like our literally me heroes, are never asleep at night, but never truly awake during the day. Taxi Driver is both empathy and a warning. It is truly loneliness caught on film, and with that comes its beauty, its pain, and its dangers. In the film, Travis calls himself God's lonely man. However, to once again quote Hideo Kojima, Every time I get into a taxi, I always look at the driver's name on their ID card. I suppose somewhere inside, I'm looking for Travis in a driver's seat. Although, of course, I've never seen the name Travis Bickle there in real life. In the world of the movie, he pulled 14-year-old Iris from the prostitution ring. But in the real world, he pulled me out of my isolation. That's why, somewhere, someday, I wish I could catch Travis' taxi, sit in the rear seat, and tell him this. If God made me a lonely man, then God must be lonely too. Rather than carry your loneliness, just pick up a lonely fare. When you realize everyone is alone, you won't be anymore. Subscribe to my channel. <laughs> Thanks. Fuck you in the lane you came with. Me and you ain't on the same shit. You ain't in my lane, bitch. Nah, all that shit in fifth. Broly on my wrist. Ay, baby, you a son. I'm my only wish. I'm counting. Blue honeys. I'm too money. Ay, that my little bitch, you too lovely. Yeah, hanging up and calling me right back. Ay, baby, why you calling me like that? Yeah. Getting high with the seat, lay back. Baby, gon' relax, yeah Ay, they don't know the half yeah. No matter what happened, I got your back Baby, that's the facts, yeah That's the facts, yeah Ay, We can fight, but the feeling's gone I try to find the words, but they never come I can still see you on the lawn Ay, laying outside in the summer sun Ay, We can fight, but the feeling's gone I try to find the words, but they never come I'll see you on the lawn hey, Laying outside in the summer sun hey, I'm with a dark skin girl on a Sunday That's that black Sabbath She put them ones all down on a Hyundai And she had a habit And she gone through ready for the runway Shawty, you the baddest Ay, Baby, that's the facts, yeah That's the facts, yeah Ay.